Bunraku, the classical Japanese puppet theatre. Accompanied by the distinctive chanting of the narrator and the expressive tone of the shamisen, the puppets are moved around in a way that makes them seem almost alive. Their expressions are so vivid you imagine you can hear them breathing. Sometimes the puppets cry, sometimes they laugh. Their movements are brought to life by the exquisite skill of the puppeteers. Specialist artisans create the puppets' faces and costumes, breathing life into their expressions. The Bunraku tradition began around four centuries ago. Until that time, puppetry and musical recitation were performed separately. But once they were combined, they gave birth to a new form of entertainment. Duty and obligation. Tragic love. The ties between parents and children. These are themes that resonate strongly among Japanese people. On this edition of Begin Japanology, we explore Bunraku and the human dramas of this theatrical tradition that continue to capture the hearts of people in Japan. Hello and welcome to Begin Japanology. I'm Peter Barakan. Today our theme is Bunraku, Japan's classical puppet theatre. And I've come to the National Bunraku Theatre here in Osaka. The word Bunraku originally derives from the name of another theatre quite close to here, where this quintessentially Japanese performing art first became popular. The name of the theatre eventually became identified with what until then had been known as Ningyo Joruri. Ningyo just means a puppet, and Joruri is a, a kind of performance where a story is chanted along with musical accompaniment. These two performing arts, which had originally been completely separate, first became combined about 400 years ago and then became known as Ningyo Joruri and subsequently Bunraku. So, first of all, let's take a look at what you might expect to see at a Bunraku performance. Bunraku has a history dating back 400 years. Combining puppets, narration and music, it's one of Japan's most distinctive traditional arts. The depth of its artistry is also highly appreciated in other countries. The National Bunraku Theatre in Osaka is the centre for this traditional performing art. Each year it stages more than 100 performances. The audience gathers in the lobby. A performance is due to start shortly. Rhythmic wooden clappers sound. The curtain is drawn to the side. The play begins. Looking at the stage, a platform can be seen on the right. It revolves to reveal the taiyu, or narrator, and one or more shamisen players. At the start of the performance, the taiyu raises the script to his forehead to demonstrate his respect for it. A single narrator delivers all the lines, providing a narrative explaining the scene and setting, and reciting the lines spoken by all the characters on stage. This is done with a unique cadence and vocal style known as Gidayu Bushi. Now the puppets appear on stage. Manipulated by teams of puppeteers called Ningyo Zukai, they move in a way that makes them seem almost alive. The puppeteers stand in full view of the audience. The audience focuses on the intricate movements and expressions of the main puppets, which are each operated by three puppeteers. This is a style of puppetry that is found nowhere else in the world. The chief puppeteer operates the head and right hand. He's the only one whose face is visible. The other two puppeteers keep their faces hidden under black hoods. One operates the puppet's left hand while the other moves the legs. 
Working in unison, they bring the puppet to life. Each Bunraku story is divided into several acts. The whole play takes a day to perform. But the acts are written so that they can be enjoyed separately. Today, it's customary for individual acts to be performed on their own. The story is reaching its climax. The Taiyu's delivery is starting to heat up. Varying the pitch and tempo of his recitation, he draws out the personality of each character. The shamisen provides an extra level of expressiveness for the narrative delivered by the Taiyu. There are three types of shamisen classified according to the thickness of their necks. Thick, medium or thin. In Bunraku, it's the thick neck shamisen that is used. Its deep tone resonates well with the voice of the Taiyu. The same melody played on the thin neck shamisen sounds too high and delicate. It doesn't suit the powerful voice of the Taiyu, so it's not used in Bunraku. The powerful delivery of the Taiyu, the rich expressive tone of the shamisen, and the puppeteers bringing the puppets to life. In a Bunraku performance, these three elements are woven together to give full resonance to the deep emotions of the play. This is the backstage area in the theatre and first of all we're going to take a look in this room which is where they keep all the heads and the wigs of the puppets and you can see the far wall there there's a whole wall full of puppets heads these are all characters that have been cast in the production that's about to begin and once they've made the decision on what's going to play and which characters are in it then each of the puppets gets given a new wig or the wig gets refitted and then the faces are made up and painted as well. Uh, for wigs there are about 120 varieties. The art of Bunraku has been refined through its long history and in addition to artistic development there have also been many innovations both in the structure of the puppets and the equipment on the stage as well. Next we'll take a look behind the scenes at a Bunraku production. The stage for Bunraku looks very different from the stages where live actors perform, such as in Kabuki. Running across the stage from left to right, there are three partitions. The puppeteers stand behind these partitions as they operate the puppets. From where the audience is sitting, it looks as though the puppets are walking along the ground. Fittings such as shoji screens hang suspended from above. Between the partitions, there are no obstacles to prevent the puppeteers from moving about freely. Out of sight, there are also many stagehands who contribute to the performance, doing things such as moving props on and off stage. There are many kinds of Bunraku puppets. They feature a number of ingenious mechanisms. The head is the most important part of the puppet. There are about 30 different male heads and around 10 kinds of female heads. These are used according to the age, status, personality, and other aspects of the character portrayed. Some of them are quite unusual.
This head of a young woman changes into a demon in a split second. In one story, it's used for a woman who is in love and who is so consumed by the heat of her passion that she's transformed into a serpent. This type of head is ingeniously constructed so that it splits in two when struck by a sword. After a play has been chosen, the heads to be used are selected from those available in such a way that they match the characters in the play. This casting process is a crucial aspect of any Bunraku production. After that's been decided, a small piece of paper is attached to the head indicating the name of the role and the puppeteer. When the selection process is finished, work begins on painting the heads to make them ready for the play. Any dust and dirt is cleaned off and the colour of the paint is changed to match the role. Then details such as the eyes and eyebrows are painted, ensuring that they fit the character. The structure of the Bunraku puppets is simple. Each consists of just a head and torso, with arms and legs attached on strings. It's the way the costumes are arranged over these parts that gives the puppets lifelike bodies. The costumes are just as important as the heads. In a single play, more than 60 costume changes may be needed. Under the costumes, there are layers of cotton padding. These create soft, lifelike bodies. The secret to making them look rounded like real human bodies lies in the way the costumes are fitted. This is how we create the bulge of the stomach. It has to be folded over a bit and curved enough to make a slight swelling. For the females, we do the same thing to form the bust. Although the puppets have no flesh or bones, the techniques used for draping and padding their costumes make them look like real people. In some plays, several heads are used for a single role. They're chosen to match changes in the character's psychology or situation. On this head, the cheeks are plump. But the same role requires using another head that makes the character look haggard. Using heads that are slightly different, or changing aspects such as the hair, it's a way to express subtle changes in the character's circumstances and emotions. The way the head is moved can also change the expression. Tilting it downwards gives the face a rather sombre feel. Cocking the head upward produces a more cheerful look. Slight changes like this can produce a wide range of expressions. There are also ingenious mechanisms that allow puppets to perform a range of actions. On the head of this young woman, a pin is fitted close to her mouth. This is used to hold a cloth in place, or the sleeve of the woman's kimono. She seems to be biting on the fabric while shaking her head, portraying a state of emotional suffering. Female puppets are not fitted with legs. The puppeteers hold the hem of the kimono to give the impression that the puppet's legs are moving while she's walking. If she trips and falls, the shape of the knee is made by the fist of the puppeteer. It makes it seem as though there really are legs inside the kimono. Thanks to these mechanisms and techniques refined over the centuries, the puppeteers create performances that captivate their audiences.
And this is the props department. You'll see all sorts of things over here. There's a hat there, some sandals, and a fox here. Oh. Ouch! And then in this little cubby hole here, there's a whole wall of swords. These look just like the real thing, except a little smaller. Oh, there we go. Basically, all of the props that are used in Bunraku plays are scaled down to the size of the puppets, which is two-thirds of what they would be uh, if humans were using them. This is the wardrobe department, and you'll see there's a whole array of costumes here which are going to be used in the production that's just about to start. All of the materials used in these costumes are exactly the same as any live actor would be wearing in any theatrical production. They're just smaller, and the motifs in the designs are all scaled down accordingly as well. And you'll see that every kimono, like this one, has a hole in the back. This is where the puppeteer's hand goes through. Now, you'll see that there are bundles here on the floor. Once a decision has been made on which play is going to be produced and which characters are going to be in that play, the wardrobe people put together these bundles of everything that's needed for each particular costume. These are then passed along to the puppeteers, and it's the puppeteers themselves who dress the characters like this. This is where they store all of the costumes. If you come in here, you'll see... These look as if they might be. No, these are women's, I think. These are all women's. Uh, all different colours and different types of kimonos. These may be men's here, I think, down at the bottom. In fact, great care is taken to make Bunraku look as real as possible. And although all of the lines are delivered by one single chanter, when you're sitting in the theatre, it's strange. It's almost like you can feel the emotions that the puppets are going through. Next, we're going to take a look at its origins and history. Bunraku was created through the merging of two performing arts that had evolved independently, puppet plays and jewellery, narrated stories with musical accompaniment. The origins of the puppet theatre date back more than 1,200 years. Shrine rituals featuring puppets have been passed down through the centuries on the island of Kyushu in southern Japan. This puppet show portrays a sumo contest between the gods. This is thought to be the earliest form of puppet theatre in Japan. In ancient times, it was believed that the puppets were actually inhabited by the gods. Around 1,000 years ago, Buddhist monks, known as Biwa Hoshi, began chanting stories while accompanying themselves on the Biwa lute. During the 16th century, the shamisen gradually became more widely used than the biwa, and the music became more melodious. Around the end of the 16th century, this merged with the puppet theatre, giving rise to ningyo joruri. The end of the civil war in the early years of the 17th century ushered in a long period of peace and stability under the Edo shoguns. Townspeople began enjoying greater affluence with more free time. Leisure activities caught on, such as going on trips, cherry blossom viewing, and especially theatre going. However, the government often tried to regulate people's daily lives, and this led to a pervasive sense of feeling stifled. To maintain social stability, a strict hierarchy was enforced with rigid restrictions. Theatres were the places where the ordinary people were able to find an escape valve. In the 18th century, as the puppet theatre developed, popular playwrights emerged. The best known was Chikamatsu Monzaimo. He wrote stories based on real events. Because the themes were ones that ordinary people could identify with, these plays were well received. Three Bunraka masterpieces in particular, written in a three-year period in the middle of the century, remain classics to this day. Sugawara Denju Tenarai Kagami, first performed in 1746, told the story of a high official of the imperial court who was forced into exile and portrayed the suffering and distress of the people close to him. This story of a father 
who has to endure the death of his son out of loyalty to his feudal lord, drew tears from the audiences. Another play that appeared the following year was Yoshitsune Senbon Zakura. It told the story of Minamoto no Yoshitsune, a general who was pursued by the forces of his brother, the Shogun. It also portrayed the sorrows of the Heiki clan, the defeated opponents of the powerful Shogun. The third play was Kanabe Hong Chushingura. Based on an actual incident earlier in the 18th century, this story of loyalty and revenge has remained an undying favorite in Japan. The main theme is one of vengeance by the 47 Ronin, masterless warriors of the Akko clan, whose pride as samurai drove them to avenge the death of their feudal lord. But there was another reason why this play became so widely acclaimed. It also incorporated a fictional love story. The loyal retainer Kampei is torn between his sense of duty and Okari, the woman he's in love with. Audiences wept at the anguish of this couple, who never lost their love for each other, while remaining set on their mission of revenge. These plays were tragedies, about people whose lives were at the mercy of the events of their times. The protagonists had to endure the pain of putting their duty ahead of love. Whether it was the love between a couple, or the bond between parents and children. Duty versus human love and affection. This was a theme that resounded strongly in the hearts of the common people. And it has continued to exert a powerful influence on Japanese literature and entertainment through the succeeding centuries. In Hollywood, generally speaking, the hero always wins. But Japanese audiences have always been attracted to a certain kind of hero who knows that he's going to lose but still keeps fighting on anyway. There's an expression in Japanese which translates as the aesthetic of the loser, referring to this approach to life. In Japanese history, you'll find various individuals who were regarded as heroes, but who never rose to the pinnacle of power. Rather, they were defeated and driven out, but they never compromised their values. And it's these kind of sentiments that tend to underlie the themes of Bunraku plays. As an illustration of this, let's take a look at a classic tale with a tragic hero and the same theme of love versus duty. Benkei Joshi is set in the Kamakura period 700 years ago. It was a time when Japan was ruled by samurai warriors. The hero of the story is the warrior monk Musashibo Benkei, who is a loyal retainer of the general Minamoto no Yoshitsune. Entrusted with an important mission, Benkei arrives at the villa where Yoshitsune's wife is staying. Because she was born into the Heike clan, the enemies of the ruling Minamoto family, Yoshitsune himself has come under suspicion of plotting against the shogun. The only way to prove his loyalty is to have his own wife murdered. Benkei's mission is to carry that out. He arrives determined to convince the lady to die for the sake of the family. But he can't bear the idea of killing his lord's wife. Not only is she very beautiful, she's also bearing Yoshitsune's child. Although Benkei is known for his forceful personality, he's conflicted and unable to take action. Yoshitsune has been falsely accused, so Benkei has no choice. But finally he has an idea. Instead of killing the lady, he will kill her serving maid, who is a similar age and resembles her. The question is, will the chambermaid agree to die in place of her mistress? The maid agrees. However, her mother refuses to let her go through with the plan. She tells her daughter that she can't make this decision without consulting her.
She explained that 17 years ago, she had a lover who fathered her daughter. However, he disappeared, and the daughter has never seen his face. The mother says her daughter must meet him at least once before dying. Until that happens, she can't agree to her daughter dying in place of the mistress. As she says this, the mother shows the sleeve of a red kimono that her lover gave her when they parted. In the 17 years since then, she has always kept this sleeve with her. Because she can't remember her lover's face or voice, this is the only clue that can lead her to him. The girl is determined to go ahead out of duty to her mistress. The mother beseeches her not to do it. But then, suddenly a sword is thrust through the gap between the sliding doors, stabbing the maid. From behind the door appears Benke. He then casts off his outer kimono. Underneath, he's wearing a red kimono one that has a sleeve missing. It was Benke who was the girl's father. Benke had been standing on the other side of the door and heard the mother's words. He realized that the maid was his daughter. However, his duty was to save his lord and his lord's wife. So he decided not to reveal to the girl that he is her father. Instead, he kills her. Benke usually expresses no emotion, but now he weeps bitterly by the body of the dead girl, and for the first time, he holds his daughter in his arms. This scene in which Benke places duty ahead of his love for his own child always touches a deep chord in people's hearts. This kind of tragic love story is something that still resonates very strongly with Japanese audiences. These masterpieces of the Bunraka theatre have been performed now for centuries, but you still find the same kind of themes being propagated even in recent television dramas. And you'll find that Japanese audiences, even today, tend to prefer tragic love stories to ones that have happy endings. The sense of self-sacrifice is something that runs very deeply in the Japanese psyche, and you can trace its roots all the way back to the Bundraka theater of the Edo period. I'll see you again next time. Next time, our theme is Kiriko Cut Glasswork. We look at the way this craft has been adopted and developed in Japan and examine its glittering appeal. <laughs>